Uh oh. Should have used a Mac. Okay. The only thing, I, I don't see how many people there are online. I don't know if they have those. Uh, I don't. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Nobody's going to see Peter Judge. <laughs> we go. Yeah. The last one's coming in. Here comes Nectar. Close the door, Nectar, will you please? All right, let's kick us off. Hi, hi. my name's Adam Backman. And I'm here with Paul Kvalis. Um Our official titles are up there. Um, I'm just a slave now I'm the, here, here at White Star. Uh, we have, uh, we're gonna do something called Benchmarking Bonanza, and we don't know what it means either. Because it was two presentations that were joined together that represent neither of the two presentations that they started from. So this so, is the bastard child of Paul and Adam here, is really what you're gonna watch. So what we wanted to do is talk about what's happening today, and there's a lot of people going from on-premise, and they're either going virtualized, or they're going to the cloud. And what we found out through a lot of testing is that the same rules apply everywhere. You can't defy physics and say, I'm gonna to go to the cloud and it's gonna be much faster. You can't defy physics and buy crappy hardware and make it work well at your own site. So none of this stuff is gonna do this. What we've done is these lessons learned that we've either learned through testing ourselves or through customers who've implemented and then said, help. And what happens is the people go out there and they go, oh, we gotta do this. And they go, oh, I'm just supposed to click this and just click through, and now I've got my machine. Well, it's not that easy, because you have to select all of the resources that you want to have. The good thing about a cloud environment is really, really flexible. Um, so before we get going, and before I get too far ahead of myself, let me just talk <laughs> He's about- He's already who, on slide 11. Yeah, I'm on 11. <laughs> um, it's gonna be a four minute presentation. Um, no, but we're the oldest and hopefully most respected um, consulting group out there. And we're independent of progress. So sometimes we do lock horns and sometimes we have opinions that don't match directly with what progresses are. Um, we have people here, it's all we do. We only do progress database performance and that's what we specialize in. And we have the best in the world who do it for us. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is what your hosting options are. And I kind of got a way ahead of myself by talking about <laughs> all this different stuff. But we're gonna talk about bare metal because we did some testing on bare metal that was really, really interesting. And we were able to make bare metal be really, really horrible with just a few changes. So that's important because that means that you may be just a few changes from being really, really fast. Or really, really horrible. <laughs> or really, really horrible. <laughs> we'll talk about virtualization, and we're not gonna dive deep into virtualization, but understand what goes on in virtualized environments, and we'll talk about the good and the bad of that. And, and, and I just wanna add here, we have 45 minutes. We're gonna try not to go over, and we're gonna fail miserably, but regardless. We're gonna, we did a lot of benchmark testing. You're, we're gonna fly through a lot of material. The goal here really is, as you look at our slides and you listen to us talk and then you look at your own environment or especially who here is in the midst of either purchasing hardware or migrating to a new environment you see there's a few people who are going through those steps right now so it's things you should keep in mind as you're making those decisions what what should you test for what you should look for and, and we're trying to more focus on the cloud because the cloud is kind of where everybody's seemingly to go. There's gonna be plenty of people who are still gonna be on-prem for the foreseeable future. But the cloud is really flexible and has a lot of benefits out there. So we'll talk, we'll talk about what's important. And what's important is important if you're on the cloud, it's important if you're on on-prem, virtualized, it's all important. Talk about the benchmarking stuff. One of the things about bare metal is that you have a lot of control. I own the environment. 
It's not, I'm not putting it someplace else. There's no one else on there. It's not virtualized. So I don't have to worry about payroll being run on my payroll app while I'm running on another VM and it being buried. So I have a lot more control. And if you want to get the best possible performance, you want to be bare metal because you're control everything and it's going to be fast. The problem is now you need to have someone who understands the hardware the operating system, progress, all of these stacks that you have to have out there, and that causes pain. Also maintenance, upgrades, now you're responsible for that. And when we buy hardware in the United States, we think of it as a three-year purchase. So I know people who takes three years just to get the purchase done, much less get it implemented. Wait, so, we, we know people who take three years to make the purchase, then three years to actually deploy the box. So by the time they've got the first person on there, it's six right, years Tom? old. <laughs> yes. But, uh, but ultimately, you're responsible for all of this. And what cloud does for you is it allows you to move and add resources dynamically. And there's cost to that, but that flexibility is sometimes immeasurable, especially if you're in a very dynamic environment that's changing and that is going out there and I'm adding users or I'm contracting users from one app and I'm adding them to another. So I have flexible use of that. And, so, you know, and what you'll find too is when, you, when you're buying bare metal hardware, if you screwed up, like you screwed up for three years, I mean, you're not gonna go back to your boss. Sorry? You mean you bought a new machine? Well, um, Mike spoke about NUMA this morning, and we did some benchmarking on NUMA, and we actually used the exact opposite approach that he did. He tested with this update heavy version of a benchmark, and we did a read only benchmark. And the results are shockingly similar, but it just goes to show that all of the performance is affected in that environment. And we'll talk about that in a NUMA section. Go to the next slide, please. This is VMware, I did. VMware, oh, you already did. Um, VMware, I like it because I can control things. I can have flexible use of resources out there. Um, it's a great way of managing a NUMA environment um, because then I can put it out on one node. Um, you have all the shared resource usage, so I'm, I'm saving on power, I'm saving on purchases of multiple items, so I can go out there and get that. There's an additional technical stack out there, and there's more licensing issues that you have out there, and that is where people tend to fall down with, with VMware, because they buy it, and all of a sudden they realize, wow, there's a bunch more cost to this stuff. So if you need it, great, use it. I have people who have one VM on a VMware machine and I go like this, I'm like, why do you have this whole extra stack for this and why are you adding another layer of performance sucking software onto this hardware? And they don't have a good answer for that. The, so, the other challenge there too is over provisioning. So by default, when you install VMware, it's going to create one virtual CPU per hyper thread. So oftentimes the number of CPUs that you see in VMware is actually twice the number of cores. So you think you're, you said, oh, I've got 32 CPUs. Let me allocate them to my servers. You're actually allocating 16 CPUs to your servers. And so you don't have as much power as you think you, you do. And, and we were talking about this yesterday, we didn't benchmark this, but I'm not sure how much value hyperthreading adds to an open edge application stack. 15 but I, per, it's 15%. 15%. We have tested it. Um, it's 15%. It's and what it is, is it's hyperthreading works because it allows two different threads to go through the CPU queue at the same time. If I have a storage request and I have a computational request, they will go through at the same time. If I have two storage requests, one will get blocked just like it gets blocked now. So there's no benefit to that. And we tend to do loads and loads of storage requests and very, very little multiplication, addition, subtraction, any of that kind of stuff. So there's very little computational work done on that, but you do get a benefit. But don't think of threads as CPUs. When you build VMware, build it with how many real CPUs that you have, how many cores you have, not how many threads you have. Um, then the cloud. The best thing about this is 
a lot of this stuff is somebody else's problem. It's your problem. They're gonna do the maintenance. They're gonna keep it up. They're gonna do all this stuff. You still have to do your backups. You still have to do important things, but you've lowered that administration cost by making it someone else's problem. They're charging you for it and they don't care. So they have, the, the one thing about um, the cloud is that CPU capacity is really, really cheap. You can buy loads of CPU capacity cheap. When you start buying storage, it's expensive, especially when you buy throughput. So we'll talk a lot about that as we go through this, but you have to worry about the pricing um, things that you have to worry about because a lot of people look at it and they go, oh, I build this machine and I have the CPU out there and it's incredibly cheap. And they don't never look at the storage side. The storage side can, in a lot of cases, will be 10X. It'll be 10 times as much. So that's where you're gonna spend your money. It's where you spend your money on on-premise machines. You buy better storage and you get better performance. You're gonna have to do the same thing in the cloud and in VM. And there's a couple of other things that I always find. One, you have to, you have to pick the right machine. So I've been to customers where, you know, they, 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 they thought they needed 500 gigs of RAM for the machine, and so they needed to buy a machine with 64 cores and then turned off whatever number of cores so they could have the 500 gigs. And you're like, you don't need 500 gigs of RAM. So you, you need to know in reality how much, uh, how much resources you really need, and people without the data to know how much resources they're using currently tend to just overbuy. It's easier to buy 32 cores and 500 gigs of RAM, uh, you know, rather than right-sizing the machine for what you need. And then, from personal experience, the other problem is you forget to turn your VMs off. And so your bill comes at the end of the month, and there's 14 VMs that somebody started and forgot to turn off that you're paying for. So if you're in that, <laughs> who has done that, please, in the, <laughs> in the cloud? <laughs> Uh, so you got to watch out for that too. I'm glad he sees the bills and is the perpetrator <laughs> of the problem. So what we're going to do is we're just going to break it down like we break down anything else. We break it down on network, then storage. No one uses disks anymore. It's storage. Okay, let's. Everything has, should be solid state by this time. If you're buying it, it should be solid state. If you're renting it, it should be solid state. Um, memory. We'll talk a little bit about memory. Buy what you need. Use what you have. But and then CPU. Um, so what we've tried to do is do benchmarks or at least give you something from the real world that we've seen in all of these areas to kind of allow you to make better choices moving forward. Right, so for the network, especially now as we're seeing more and more people doing you know, separated architecture, having PaaS on separate servers, uh, doing more and more client server communications. Of course, you can always make your application better to read less data, but we still want to maximize the throughput. How much data can we push across the network or pull across the network? And that's really what we're trying to measure it here. And what we do is we look at how fast we can read data in shared memory, and then we make the comparison, right? That'll be the fastest you can pull. If you're local to the machine, shared memory connection, I can pull data at this speed. Let's compare how fast I can pull it across the network, whether it's through the local host adapter, the loopback adapter, or really through the NIC itself, through the actual uh, network. All right, so this, I don't know how easy this is gonna be. To, oh, it's not bad. Nice big humongous screen. So here's some data I, we just pulled from some of our clients who have decent client server performance. And, and so what I'll show here is if this actually works up here, come on. No, this is the right one, this one. Look at that, isn't that cool? I love these toys. Eh? <laughs> so, so what this shows here is. I hope he didn't expense that. I expense everything, what are you talking <laughs> about? <laughs> So what's cool here is you can see that for this particular client in shared memory, we can read the fastest we can read. We have this metric in ProTop called user experience shared memory. So we're essentially trying to read schema tables, which we know are always in memory. We'll see how fast can we read those schema tables so we can measure how, what's really the high watermark of how fast I can read data out of the disk. And so I can see here, I can read about 168,000 records per second. 
uh, in shared memory. I can read about 120,000 records per second in localhost and about 90,000 records per second in client server. And it's pretty noisy. If you look at the graphs, it's, it's quite noisy, but it gives you an idea. And as you look over a longer period, the noise kind of flattens out and you get an idea. And the goal here is twofold. It's not, it's to see what the raw numbers are, of course, but also to see the, the relative numbers, right? And, and we'll, of course, we'll see that in the next slide when we show bad data. Yeah. Is that client server two? I use MM eight sixteen. I use prefetch delay and all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. The quest, so the question is, is that client server tuned? And the answer is yes. And I'll show some benchmarks on that that we did specifically on on that question about with or without minus MM and with prefetch. Yeah. Well, there's two different time periods shown here. This, this first one is probably showing a whole day or, or multiple days. And this bottom one showing a shorter, much shorter period of time. Right. These are showing, this, the bottom one showing kind of, you can see each individual sample there. And those are five minute samples. And then above there, you see lots and lots of samples over multiple days. Okay, right, so and, and we'll usually look at 10 days to start. And then we want to see if there's any strange variations. And then we'll, we'll zoom in where the problem occurs and say, okay, well, you know, Monday at this time, you always have this problem where the performance drops. And let's try to figure out what's happening on Monday at this time, for example. But having that long-term view really helps you understand how your systems are, are performing overall. All right. So let me go to the next one. Good here. All right, here's some bad ones. <laughs> so the, the first one up there, the first bad one up there, uh, sorry, here, was interesting. If I can get up there, come on, technology. So this one is interesting here, untuned completely with some problems. You can see that we could read at 135,000 records per second in shared memory and only 13,000 records per second in client server. And even worse, this was a problem at a customer we had. Here's a super machine on Azure with super fast Xeon Platinum CPUs. We could read 490,000 records per second in shared memory and 10,000 records per second in client server. And you wonder why the client called to ask us to help them because their Azure migration was, was at risk because they didn't understand why performance was wrong. All right? And just to tell you, it ended up being an Azure network misconfiguration. So they were going through some hops and jumps and VPNs and firewalls, and it was misconfigured, and it was just it was just throttling their network. Uh, yeah. their you, network. you can tell Azure and you can tell AWS that you want the machines to be proximate to each other. You want them to have close approximation. And that's huge because what you're doing is you're reducing the amount that the, each round trip costs you. So that's where you're here. We're paying that long round trip time. Plus we have untuned clients as well. So it's, you know, it's, we're doing everything as bad as we can do it at this point. So here I did some benchmarking. Now this is to, to Mike's question. This is tuned right with minus mm 16k with the prefetch parameters and i can see these are these are numbers that for me are are the relative values are normal i can see that i'm doing client server at about half the rate of my shared memory and i'm doing the local host at a little bit more than that and the numbers will vary from machine to machine but overall if i see these kinds of other numbers i'm not freaking out i'm not saying oh my god there's a major problem here that i need to correct and, and these are the kind of numbers you should be looking at right so whether you're using protop rt uh, which uh, who was in tom's uh, talk what's new in protop was anybody in that talk earlier today perfect so tom was there <laughs> <laughs> so so it's either you using... still remember at his age. <laughs> so whether you're using Protop RT or you're using the commercial version of Protop or the free web version of Protop, you have this data, you can see this data uh, in Protop. All right. So here's where it gets uh, where it gets interesting. So we started saying that you know the closer you are from the client machine to the server machine, of course, the faster it is. So I started playing around on Azure and on Amazon, 
going to a different subnet, going to a different virtual private cloud, trying to put distance between the server machine and the client machine. We see that often at the clients, right? They'll put the, I don't know, they'll put the Windows terminal servers on one subnet, they'll put the other, the database servers on another subnet for security purposes, for example. So, interesting benchmark here. You can see that for Amazon, when I went to an adjacent subnet, it actually ended up being faster. I don't know why it was faster. Uh, the only thing I can guess is that even if it was on an adjacent subnet, uh, it was a physically closer VM, right? Because it's all auto magical networking by, by Amazon anyways. So that's the only thing I can guess. I don't know if anybody else has a theory as to why um, across a different subnet in the same virtual private cloud it would be faster. Uh, faster, yeah. And then when I did the same benchmark from a separate virtual private cloud, so now I'm really jumping from one network to another network, so there's an actual jump there, you can see that the performance dropped somewhat, though not incredibly. But again, my goal here really is I want to know that the, these are the ratios that are about right, you know, two to one is an interesting ratio. If you're seeing ten to one ratios, then you know there's a problem. So it could be a configuration problem, you're not using minus MM and the prefetch, or it could be some network misconfiguration. But the important thing is you have the data and you can see that and you can fix the problem. Oh boy. Eeny, <laughs> <laughs> meeny, miny, mo. Gus, Gus, age before, not beauty, but sorry. A lot of times you don't get a whole machine to yourself. No. You never know who else is on the same machine sucking up all the CPU cycles or all the disk bandwidth. Or the network. Right. Correct, yeah. So the the comment from from Gus, actually you said it in the mic so everybody heard it, but yes, you have no idea. And that's one of the risks with Amazon, unless you do like the really provisioned, super expensive stuff. And Mr. Fergal. The other thing would, that would be interesting is what's the ping time between those two machines? Did you, when you found out that it was faster, did you look at the ping time to see if the ping time was faster? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I take do. the mic away from them. <laughs> That's okay. Valid question. Also, all this applies to Azure as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It, More it's so. All, yeah, it, they're both are essentially the same thing and they slice it up a different way. But you're really buying the same thing. You're buying memory, you're buying CPU, and then you're adding storage to it. So those things are all happening and they're trying to tell you you're getting these things and you are, and, um, but it's, they're all slicing the same thing a different way to try to get your money. And the Azure UI sucks, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't have an opinion on that. No, no. <laughs> If I had an opinion on the Azure UI, that opinion would be that it sucks, but I don't have an opinion. But one of, one of the things here is that before you make the move to the cloud, it's a good idea to have some performance metrics and take ProTop free, put it on your system, and know what it looks like now before you make a cloud jump. Then you can go out and test it in the cloud and make sure that the numbers that you were seeing are approximate to the numbers you are seeing now. Because it's really important to know that. And you don't have to use ProTop. You can do it with anything else you want to do it with. We're just using it because it happens to be the tool we use every day. But it's the part we're asking you to use is free. And you know, uh, so Mike mentioned the network startup parameter, so I did the test and you can see here, b both in Azure and Amazon, when you go from the default, which is minus MM1024 and none of the prefetch parameters, and then you go to minus MM16384 and the prefetch parameters, you can see, I only did it in localhost, I didn't do it across the network for whatever reason. But oh, you can see that you're, that you're, yeah, I'm lazy. You would have initialized jumbo frames and a bunch of other stuff. To, to really get yep. through it. Yeah. So, but regardless, you can see that even graphically here, you can see that my, you know, my throughput went from, from 38 to 110,000 reads per second on uh, AWS and from 80,000 to 200,000 on, uh, on Azure. And, and they're not the same. They're not comparable CPU machines either. So. Again, don't look at the numbers and say Azure is better than Amazon. It's just the random machines that I picked to, to do my benchmarking tests. So again, it's the relative numbers. And they're still running today and we're paying for them. Yeah. 
and I think you, I heard you said you did not deal with jumbo frames. This is just this is just making the change to MM and prefetch, right? Yes, but we it's localhost, yeah. right? So you're 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 you have two gig. Like did you the, did you do client server? I guess my point I'm trying to make is I've done a lot of this, and everybody gets hung up on jumbo frames. And no, don't let don't get hung up on it. No. Yeah. it's not required in order to make a change like this. No, I agree. I agree, and we don't. The, it was the overhead is the packeting overhead. It's yeah. not the transport overhead. The yeah. transport works just as good, even if it has to break it across a couple packets. Yeah. Yeah, in the back. Wait a second. Question. Why did you increase the NM uh, to 16384? Why don't you use a, the half? Or why don't I use 8000 or? Yes, yeah, something like that. Yeah, so the question is why did I use 16 and not 8K and not 8K or 32K? And you're, you're right, you probably get 90% of the bang at 8K, then you get another you know, 8 or 9% of the bang at 16K, and from 16 to 32 you get very little. And someone else has an opinion on this too. <laughs> Well, so that's the maximum message size. Right. If the data you're sending is less than that, it sends less. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And then at one point I toyed about spending more time benchmarking on a database that had larger, more data so that I could fill those packets more. But, but even I've done this at, on client databases and the curve hasn't really gone up spectacularly from 16 to 32, even when I've tested this at, you know, with customer data, not just with, uh, with sports database data. What we know for a fact is 1K is horrible. So get off of 1K yeah. and get up to something greater than that, at least 8K. Yeah, and the excuse used to be that you had to change all the client ones and all the server ones and they had to match and it was a pain in the butt because you always forgot one somewhere who complained on Monday morning, but since 11.6-ish or so, that's no longer the, the case. So really there's no excuse to just go set MM to 16.384 and just turn it on and forget about it. There's... Amen. Sorry? Amen. Amen. Okay. <laughs> You are blessed. <laughs> uh oh, storage. Are we running out of time? I'll yeah, I know. Don't <laughs> You're going to be here till eleven. All right. Storage. They're going to bring the beer this into is, the room. <laughs> the whole idea here is that the reason you have a database is because you want to look at data, and it's all on storage. So this is where you're going to spend your money. You're going to spend it in the cloud. You're going to spend it locally. What you want to do is you want to buy SSD. It's the only way to go when you're buying from Amazon or you're buying from Microsoft, you need to go to their SSD layer. Everything except the very lowest level on Azure is SSD. And the cost goes up as you switch up, but you don't need to go to ultra disk every time on Amazon because it's incredibly expensive. So look at the lower levels and look at your throughput needs and see if they'll meet them because you get a much better price per month on that. So it's, it's really important. And, and don't forget that SSD on a SAN is not SSD in a machine. I can't count the number of times that people have told me that their SAN is super fast. It's all SSD. It's all flash. You're like, sure, but it's like, 47 miles away in another data center, so the, the, the bottleneck is not the SSD or the flash, because anyways, there's 128 gigs of RAM cache on the SAN anyway, so you're probably writing to the, the cache on the SAN. The bottleneck is the brocade network and the 47 virtualization layer. It's layers. the same thing we talked about with networking. Exactly. It's the distance between you and the SAN. Yes, sir. I'm gonna guess that the salesman's lips were moving. The salesman's lips were moving. That, that means he was lying. That's right. That's right. And I always quote Mr. Tom Bascom. You can quote him on this. There ain't no such thing as a high performance sand. That is a, also a salesman lip moving tactic. Okay. All right. So here's some, some, uh, some, um, some benchmarks. So these, this is real customers. The top customer bare metal server, local SSD, and you can see this guy, he's pulling roughly on, on the Fergal test, on the Sync IO test. Uh, does anybody not know what the Sync IO test, the Fergal test is? Anybody not, do I, have, do I need to explain it? Don't be shy. Don't, okay, he wants me to. <laughs> he's like, it's Give the Bjorklin test, it's not the Fergal test. <laughs> so this, what we do in the Sync IO test is 
we, we truncate the BI, set the BI block, uh, BI cluster size to 16 megabytes and then we grow the BI to six clusters, so 96 megabytes because that's an unbuffered write and it gives us a good measure of how fast you can do unbuffered writes to the disk because that's what the database done, does when it writes to the BI and to the AI file. So writes to the data files are buffered but the rest of the stuff is unbuffered. So that's how fast you really want to go. And I'll show you guys in a bit. My number is, you know, most high performance SANS <laughs> are at around that 10 megabytes per second mark. When you get to SSD, you can see here we're at 110 megabytes per second. This other customer has bare metal machine with flash drives, with NVMe drives. We peak at 190 megabits per second. And, you know, and, and why is this important? Here's a, you know, hamster drive here. So here's a, here's a current customer that we have that we're working with. Their sync I.O. rate is two megabytes per second. So what does that mean? If your BI cluster size is eight megabytes and you need to format a BI cluster, you will freeze the database for four seconds while the hamsters are writing the BI cluster onto the disk. So that becomes a problem and the, the customer wonders, hey, I wonder why every now and then my system freezes. I don't know, maybe because you have shit, dis I mean bad disk I.O., sorry. <laughs> and then on the top one, well that's a classic SAN, right? When I see this 8, 9, 10, 12 uh, mega, megabytes per second, that's a, a classic SAN that we see. And again, it doesn't matter if there's SSD or XYZ drives, this is the number we're typically going to get from a SAN. All right, so now some benchmarking data for you guys. So who are our contestants? We mentioned we have a, a machine with flash, a machine with SSD, <coughs> excuse me, we have these Azure premium uh, SSD, those are P40 disks that we use, 7500 IOPS, uh, 250 megabit throughput. We've got an AWS GP2 at 4500 IOPS, uh, on, on the Amazon machine and then our personal favorite, Tom's personal fami favorite here, ephemeral storage. Uh, yes. So um, how much did you pay for each of those? Wait, that's another slide later. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, good. All right, so the, I just, you know, I didn't want to take a hundred terabyte whatever database and have to copy it to a bunch of places. So I've got a big sports database. It's about 16 gigabytes. It's good enough for, for these tests here, okay? And when I run pro backup minus com, it generates about a four and a half gigabyte backup file. So it's big enough for it to be, you know, not the sports database. Let's put it that way. So doing the backup on local flash, 75 seconds on local SSD. For some reason I didn't do it. I'm going to presume it's going to be a little bit more than that. On the P40s, 87 seconds. On the GP2, 162 seconds. It makes sense, right? The, those P40s are giving us 7,500 IOPS and the, the GP2s on Amazon are giving us 4,500 IOPS. It makes sense. But the really interesting one is that ephemeral storage on Amazon is giving us essentially local flash timing, right? And for those, does anybody does anybody using ephemeral storage on Amazon other than Tom? <laughs> I'll, I'll just take one second to explain it quickly. Um, what ephemeral storage is, is for certain classes of machine on Amazon, you can get local flash uh, drives. So it's local flash ephemeral drives. The only problem is, is when you put your database on there, if you happen to stop the instance, that drive goes poof. And so your database goes poof. <laughs> so, but, but just, just the whole thing, it would be like deleted, it would be like deleting the machine from your machine room is deleting that. So it's not something that's likely to happen. You'd have to go way out of your way to make that happen. It's not impossible, but really nothing's impossible. Someone could take the machine and throw it out the window. So ephemeral storage is perfectly reasonable storage to use as long as you have a backup and you do after imaging and use replication. So it's perfectly fine and it's blindingly fast. So again, all the advantages of local flash on the cloud. And if you look at number one local flash, 14 seconds for the restore. So I've restored into a variable extent database. So I didn't 
create a structure before. I just did pro rest into an empty uh, directory. So 14 seconds to grow the file to accept the restore and then 27 seconds to restore. And you can see the ephemeral storage is right along those same numbers. So very, very cool. All right. Money. Money. So ephemeral storage I mentioned is included depending on the class of machine that you get. So it's very, very cool. You can get 200 gigs, 400 gigs, what, depending what you need, depending how much CPU you need. So that'll go into your equation of how much money you want to spend on your machine. Maybe you'll spend a little more because you'll get the ephemeral storage. Um, and like I wrote here, if you're not disciplined, if you're a little loosey-goosey in your in your procedures, if you know, if your question, you know, your reboot procedure is I come in Saturday morning uh, at three o'clock after coming in from the clubs and I do right click reboot. Oops, wrong machine. So sorry. You know, you probably don't want to use ephemeral storage. You really, you know, you, you want to be disciplined about that because it could be mildly catastrophic. Let's put it that way. All right. So the GP2 disks, 10 cents per gig per month. So a terabyte disk is going to cost you roughly a uh, hundred bucks a month US and you're going to get about 3,000 IOPS uh, included because Amazon includes 300 IOPS per gigabyte or three IOPS, sorry, per gigabyte uh, for a GP2 storage. But you can get GP3 which is eight cents per gigabyte. It's cheaper but then you have to pay for your IOPS but you get 3,000 IOPS included. So you're actually, if you only need 3,000 IOPS for your workload, you're better off buying a GP3 at $82 a month or if you want to spend $100 a month, you get 7,500 IOPS. And why did I put 7,500 IOPS? Because the P40 that we're going to show in a second excuse me, that from, the, from Azure is a 7500 IOPS machine. All right. And then the biggest takeaway from this is when you're building Amazon instances, don't build little disks. Little disks have little IOPS. So you want to build really big disks. And because you're not paying more, you're, you're going to pay the same amount for the same amount of space. But if you build one large store rather than few small stores, you're going to get a lot more throughput. So do it on the LVM instead uh, as opposed to, to doing physical disks that you create in, in Azure or in Amazon. All right. So Azure. So your options, standard SSD, premium SSD or what they call ultra disks. And, and what you'll see in just a second is the standard and the premium. They kind of come in pre-formatted bundles, right? This much space with this much IOPS for this much money. Whereas we saw on AWS, you kind of went in, I want 11 terabytes, I want this many IOPS, what's the price? Thank you very much, let's go. And that's really where ultra disks come in. So if you want that kind of flexibility, typically for more IOPS, then you'll go to ultra disks, but you'll see in a minute you're going to pay for those uh, ultra disks. So, uh, I'm just going to gloss over this, but you can see a little bit the difference between the, the things, the different disks. We're running out of time, so I'll gloss over them. Yeah, that was directly from Microsoft's website, so you can get that one there. Right. And then these are just how you pick the disks. You go out there and it'll tell you that you have the bundles that he's just talking about. So I got how big it is, it's one terabyte, 500 provisioned, IOPS, and 60 meg per second. So they give you IOPS and megs per second on there exactly. and you have to look at it. So you get that for $77 a month and if you go to a P40 or a P30, now there you get your terabyte with 5,000 IOPS a month and 200 megabytes uh, per second of throughput for about $135 a month. Or now, what I like to say, double. <laughs> right. Now what's interesting about Azure is if you, if you need one terabyte but you need 7,500 IOPS, you have to buy a P40, which is two terabytes. So you're going to pay for two terabytes, whether you use one terabyte or less, they're going to charge you for the full two terabytes. So you might as well use two terabytes if you need those 7,500 IOPS. And if you go to ultra disks, then it starts to get expensive. So one terabyte at 7,500 IOPS on an ultra disk is 500 bucks. Yes, sir. So if you only need one terabyte, but you want 7,500 IOPS, what are you going to do with the extra terabyte? Store more stuff on it. 
Put your but cat pictures on. I don't have on. more stuff. <laughs> no, you can download cat pictures from the cat, internet. Cat pictures from the internet, correct. What you do is you open up the web server ports to the internet and within about one or two days <laughs> there will be 400 gigs of porn on your server and then that will use up all the space. Did I say that? That's recorded. Sorry. <laughs> Was that out loud? <laughs> That's never happened. All right. Memory. We, we have memory and CPU to do. We are going to go over. No surprise. I apologize, but we'll try to go through. Memory is fast. Go ahead. But just the takeaway on memory, really just look at how much memory you're using and make sure that you're not just throwing it all away to file cache and all that other stuff. Your people tend to overbuy, so just buy what you need, but use what you have because it's important for performance to do that and use that in performance enhancing things like increasing the big B and doing the smart things with it. The NUMA can, um, things about this are really, really important because what happens when you buy a NUMA machine, you have these zones, each zone or um, each box inside a NUMA box has CPU and memory that's tightly integrated. If I need more than one zone can support, in that I have to use two zones and my performance is going to drop precipitously and we're going to show that coming on. And so that's, that's exactly this is what this picture is trying to show here is that you've got your CPUs up there and those red squares are showing what you see. Then you have this high speed interconnect. High speed interconnect is great. It's really high speed, but every thing that I need to do and when I talk about everything I need to do up in shared memory, which is all the latching information, if I have to go from one to the other, the best case scenario is it's going to be three times longer. Most of the time, if I have a cache miss, it's going to be five to seven times longer and it gets much, much worse. So it's important to stay inside of one set. And we have a, a pretty shocking benchmark to show. Exactly. All right. So here's a benchmark. So Mike, for those who are at Mike's top, Mike did an ATM benchmark on a NUMA machine. We did a read probe benchmark. And what read probe is, uh, is essentially we, the, the, the read probe benchmark launches uh, underscore progress clients that just read a lot. In fact, the program name is readalot.p and it launches one, then it launches two. 10, 50, it just keeps launching them until you tell it to stop launching them and then it measures how much throughput you can get uh, on that database, right? And so, and it'll tell you, oh, your maximum throughput was 11 processes, that's when you hit that maximum throughput range, all right? And there's zero disk I.O., that's really the important thing. We're really, we're exercising CPU and memory, we're using uh, the sports database, so everything's in memory with it's a very small database. We put minus B10,000, so there's zero disk I.O. that's involved in this. All right, so what happened? We did this on um, a physical machine. It has eight Xeon Platinum processor. Uh, what am I looking at? Oh, no, sorry. This is on Azure. I apologize. So I first did the benchmark on Azure here. So this benchmark is not a NUMA benchmark. It's just a regular read pro benchmark. So on this Azure machine with eight Xeon Platinum cores, I was able to push through about 2.5 million reads per second on that machine, right? No NUMA is involved here at all. Uh, after that, it didn't really matter how I played around with the different startup parameters. Once I got rid of LRU skips, uh, I started hitting BHT latch weights and even playing around with different parameters. I was at 100% CPU all the way. The numbers really didn't change no matter uh, what I played around with parameters. But I'm using 100% CPU now uh, and I'm getting about 2.5 million reads per second out of that off that server. And then I did the same thing on, on Amazon. It's a slower machine. Uh, these are these uh, E5 CPUs, slower, same results but just less throughput. But you can see the, the, the two graphs actually mirror each other. I did exactly the same benchmark. So you can see the first one here on the, on the left I, that I did here has a different, a, a little lower peak. And then every other benchmark I did mostly had a higher peak. Uh, and then same thing when I did it on Amazon, just at a lower number. So I, I can, I know I can push that machine to 100% CPU. I'm only doing, there's no disk I.O. at all. That's how much I can push through. So let's do it on NUMA. So here's a NUMA box. It has 
four CPUs, eight cores each, and each CPU is in its own NUMA zone. So that means core zero to seven are one zone, one, you know, eight to 15, and so on and so forth. So I ran the read pro benchmark across all 32 cores. I didn't tune anything, no NUMA control things that, that Mike was talking about in his talk. I just ran read probe regularly, and I said, okay, let's see how fast I can get. And the fastest I could get was about two million reads per second. And can anybody guess how many processes I went through to hit two million reads per second? Who said eight? Anybody else? The answer is one. So the first read pro <laughs> process hit two million reads per second. The second one, two million reads per second. The third one, two million reads per second. So I maxed out at two million right off the bat, and I stayed there the whole time. It didn't really, really matter how many I, I did. 16, 20, 30, 40, I was pretty much at two million reads per second. Didn't matter how I tuned anything, that's where I got two million reads per second on this. On a 32 core machine. Four CPUs, four zone, 32 cores. So that, 30, that two million reads per second was the total for however many processes you were running? Yes, you could, you could have one or many. We know, thanks. Um, you could have one or many and it was still two million. That was it. That was the foot to the floor. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, oops, did I go the wrong way? I did, here we go. All right. So we said, all right, let me run the benchmark, but using NUMA control to force all of the processes onto one NUMA zone, all right? And now, right away, four million reads per second. So just by forcing all of the read pro processes, no matter how many I started, eight, 10, 16, 32, I could now hit four. So I doubled my throughput. And usually the double, I think, was around 11, 10 or 11 processes. And then it kind of flattened out. I was using all eight CPUs. I couldn't do anything about it. So to be clear, when you, to be clear, just to, I want to understand this more. And when you didn't do any NUMA control, one process, one read pro process gave you the best result. Yes. When you used NUMA control, 11 processes gave you the best result. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then, all right, then he said, I'm going to do this again, but I'm going to have one out of zone process. So he forces one. one process to go out of the zone. And with that drop, we drop from 4 million down to 3.1 million. That's with just one process out of band. And that shows you that that's not just affecting one thing out there, it's affecting everybody's performance. And that's why this NUMA is so insidious. The, the NUMA processes, if you don't manage them properly, can be tragic for performance. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to manage the processes rather than them do this. One of the things that people ask me is like, why don't I see this right at the beginning when I implement a NUMA machine? And the reason is, is because it's hardwired to do the right thing at low load. It's gonna keep everything in one zone. As soon as you make it work hard, then the scheduler has to spread it across all the zones, and that's when the performance drops off for progress. And, and, and I'm gonna, see this is where you get screwed, sorry, because you buy a machine with four zones or two zones, and then you say, I'm gonna test the machine before going into production, but you're never gonna put a full load. Most people will do a half load or a small load. They test the machine, performance is amazing because their test load stays in one zone, and then they're like, we're ready to go into production. And then like one and a half hours into production, and they're like, oh, I spent $800,000 on this machine, you know? And then we tell them to turn off half the CPUs, Correct. which makes us really popular yes. with the people. <laughs> and then the last test that you did, you did another one where you added two out of zone processes and you, you dropped back down to almost what you saw when it was unmanaged completely. So okay. it's really important, really, really important to know that you're on NUMA and then to do the right thing. And, um, I don't want to go too long. I just want to say that if anyone has questions about this stuff, come see me or Paul or Tom at our booth and we can tell you all about NUMA and all the horror stories details. of what we've seen out there. It's, and Mike said, yes, we can run on NUMA. And the answer is yes, we can run on NUMA as long as we do it intelligently, as long as we manage the processes and don't allow them to manage us. 
So, and this is where, you know, if you happen to buy a NUMA box accidentally <laughs> for, your, for your load, this is where maybe VMware makes more sense because on modern versions of ESXi, you can say, pin this VM to, you know, one node and then you don't have to do any of the NUMA control stuff at the operating system. It's all kind of being done at the hypervisor level, anything that runs in that process in that and if, yeah, if there, if there is a if there's a catastrophic failure, you'll fail and have to reboot and choose another zone. So just know that you do lose some flexibility with uh, with VMware because you've hard set that to use zone zero. If you if zone zero has a problem, then it's going to go away and you're going to have to come up on another zone. But it just is a I'm going to reboot, come up on VMware and say, okay, now go to zone one. Right, so again, if, if you did happen to buy a, a multi-zone machine, a NUMA machine, and you thought you were going to run it bare metal, well, consider installing a hypervisor on it. Okay, the rules are yeah. the same. Yes, Gus. So aside from VMware, have any of you guys tried Proxmox? Who? Proxmox. It's another hypervisor. It's no, uh, well, we didn't do any testing on any other hypervisors, but uh, just uh, most of these modern hypervisors are NUMA aware, and they will allow you to make your thing zone aware, so you can do that. Um, but the rules for the stuff that we're talking about, hardware, on-prem, VMware, and the cloud are all the same. Make sure that you have the right number of CPUs. When you're buying CPUs, you want to have the fewest, fastest CPUs you can have. And that box that we saw there that had 32 CPUs, it runs fastest when we take one zone and we run in that one zone. And so we've had to use one quarter of that box, which again made us really popular. But they don't have VMware, they wanna run bare metal. So we have to force it and we had to turn off the other boxes basically. Storage is where you need to spend the money. You're gonna spend it if you spend it on-prem or if you spend it with these other guys, but buy what you need and you can go to a lower tier if you can find the IOPS that you need. Just know, use a tool to figure out what you're doing now so you know what to buy. And always remember, especially in a cloud environment, if you're on, if you're on a tier that's not fast enough, you can go click, click, click and go to a faster tier disk. It'll take a little bit of time to migrate the data to the faster disk, but you can do that when you're in the cloud. You have that flexibility. If you bought the hardware and it's sitting in your data center, once again, you know, those disks are you. just like those extra cores that you maybe can't use and, and you don't have money to replace them. Okay, I think. We're asking for questions, comments. Ah, seven minutes. We're not or personal problems. No, no personal problems. No personal problems. Personal problems. Okay, let's go drink beer. Old. Are we going to go drink beer now? No, in an hour the oh, thing starts. Oh, come on. Questions? I'm going to go drink beer now <laughs> and go to the next presentation. There is no other presentation. We're okay, done. I'm going to just go drink beer now. Okay, good. Uh, if you do have questions, please come to the booth. If you want to learn more about ProTop and the tools that we use to benchmarking, whether the free version or the commercial version, come and see us. I have a lot of swag that I do not want to bring back to Canada. Please stop by the booth just take so that anything. I can Bulky give you. Bulky items are really easy please, for you to take. Please come and take some of the swag from me. So thank you very much everyone. Thanks. Yeah. That was like seven minutes man. Holy crap. That was on time for you. Yeah. Can I have your mic?